In this presentation, we will have a laboratory session. We're going to look at a cantilever beam with a tip load that oscillates at varying frequency. This is really what's called a frequency response problem. The cantilever beam is physically the same one that was studied earlier to find its normal modes. Later, in another lecture, we will relook at this case using a so-called modal methods where the base vectors in the problem are taken to be the modes of the undamped system. A more precise name for what we're doing then in this lecture is to call it a direct solution for frequency response. I start with a physical statement of the problem and then I separate out the physical modeling from the finite element modeling, which I like to do. We look at the NASTRAN data set, look at the results, and then I do the problem again with several values of structural damping. The cantilever beam that we study is slender. It's 30 times longer than it is deep. We'll use a coordinate system at the left end, x along the axis, and z vertical. The force is vertical, therefore the linear system will oscillate in the xz plane. The cross-section was symmetric and solid, so there won't be any unusual coupling between this vertical motion and other motions in the problem. Our solution is going to run as shown here, where we drive the uh, oscillating force through the first natural frequency of the body and show this peak near the first frequency. Interested viewers can easily extend the frequency range on up to capture the behavior near the second and third natural frequencies. Physical modeling that we do, um, we're going to use the small deflection behavior of the Euler-Bernoulli beam, which has plane sections remaining plane. We're going to assume linear elastic material behavior and planar motion in the XZ plane. We'll be neglecting torsional vibration and axial vibration and out-of-plane vibration. That is, motion in the XY plane. We'll only check frequencies every two hertz. Nowadays, with fast workstations, people can do a much finer frequency resolution than that if they wish. Our finite element modeling will again be a simple two-bar element model. We'll constrain the root of the beam, making it a cantilever beam with the tip free. We'll constrain all of the unneeded degrees of freedom at the outboard nodes, namely the axial, torsional, and out-of-plane bending degrees of freedom, 1, 2, 4, and 6. That will again leave us these four active degrees of freedom during the solution. And our oscillating force acts directly on what I'm calling U5 here. Uh, these have been renumbered in a local sort of a way just to show the total number of degrees of freedom here. In a frequency response problem, one of the more serious tasks is to identify the details about the oscillating load. Mathematically, our tip force has this form of a thousand newtons oscillating at a frequency uh, characterized by this capital omega. There's a very general capability within MSC NASTRAN to model such loads, and they allow you to either use a rectangular Cartesian approach in complex variables typified by these constants or a polar version typified by uh, these constants and phase lags with this amplitude. Uh, we're going to choose to use uh, the form with the amplitude of a thousand newtons 
and then set the imaginary part to be zero here and to set the um, these various phases in here to be zero and uh, and not to have any offset time scale it's helpful to me to diagram the relation of some of the data entries in MSC Nastran. When you have a frequency response case, um, we call for a dynamic load here up in the case uh, control. And there is also a related frequency card. Both of those point down to bulk data entries below. We have this R load one card that allows us to enter those five parameters that, that generally characterize a harmonic load. The frequency has a set of discrete frequencies called out on the Freq1 card, and each one of those solutions then is equivalent to a static finite element solution. So you can see that if you ask for a lot of frequencies then you can, in principle, have a, uh, an expensive run. Now let's look at the exact data cards that we're going to use. First of all, we have the ID with uh, as many as eight characters in each of two words separated by a comma, starting with a alphabetical character. Time in minutes, we're going to use SOL 108, direct frequency response. This is in contrast to a modal frequency response. Case control commands, we have a title, and uh, I'm going to call this a subcase one, just for a general training tool. There's only one subcase, so it's a little bit superfluous. Then we have a subtitle. We're going to ask for all the displacements. I will continue with the case control commands. Here's our dynamic load, which is a flag pointing below. Here's our frequency flag that also points below. And here are plot instructions. And in this case, we're going to look at the shape of the deformed beam. Now, the beam will go through some sort of a deformation pattern and then we will be oscillating back and forth between those two extremes. And uh, we'll just plot one half of that cycle at a reference time. We'll look into the minus y axis using x horizontal to the right and z vertical up. And we'll uh, plot and label the, uh, the elements and uh, nodes and look at deformations as a function of frequency. Now the bulk data entries involve the same three grid points that we had previously. Here we show the remainder of the bulk data entries. The connectivities here are standard. They do involve a vector which points out the one plane. The two plane is taken perpendicular to that. And it's actually the I2 here, the smaller of the two moments of inertia that control the flexure of the beam bending in the, uh, in the two plane. Our material here is standard for steel with the density. We will use coupled mass again as we did in the normal mode problem. Here's our dynamic loading as referenced from above in the case control. It has a magnitude 11 which points to a D area card and that gives a 
uh, node and a direction of the force and then the magnitude of the force of a thousand. The 27 points to a scale factor which could be a uh, frequency changing magnitude of force change and a graph is set up with the coordinates 2 and 1 here showing the starting point uh, and then uh, 18 and 1 showing the ending point so we have a constant scale factor of unity over the frequency range. Then the Freak 1 card here tells about the specific points at which the uh, frequency response will be calculated. Starting at 2 hertz in increments of 2 hertz and 8 more times. Uh, these data were entered into a uh, workstation on my desk and then networked to a Sun workstation at the Michigan Computer Aided Engineering Network where it was run on MSC Nastran. In discussing our results, let me first review the natural frequencies uh, and mode shapes for our beam. We already found from an earlier lab that the fundamental mode was 9.2 hertz and the mode shape looked like this. Second mode 57 hertz with this mode shape and third 161 with this mode shape. Now as you shake this body at a very low frequency you will probably get something close to the static deflection shape of a beam with a tip load. Now that's a shape that I'm not showing here. It would be a cubic curve though, the exact solution would be a cubic. Then when you come through the first mode, you'll get this shape, which is uh, actually known to be a transcendental function when you solve for it exactly. Hyperbolic functions, sines, cosines, and so on. And then these second and third modes are also transcendental when you get exact solutions. So we know that when you excite this beam with frequency starting up at zero you're going to get a response it's almost like the static shape uh, if, if it were a very low frequency people might call that a quasi static response then at these other frequencies when your exciting force is near a natural frequency that shape will dominate in fact so you can expect it to look like this figure when we plot the displacement amplitudes of our forced beam between 0 and 20 hertz. Let me show you the actual output from our run. Here is the sorted data echo. A nice way to look at the data when you um, want to get it in a universal form that other people can easily understand. From the tabular results, let me show you a couple points that bracket the natural frequency. Here we have the frequency of 8 hertz, and you can see the mid-node uh, translation in the z direction uh, as 4.5 uh, millimeters, and then outboard at the tip we have 13 millimeters. That's when you're slightly below the natural frequency. When you get above the natural frequency, uh, then you find that the displacements are out of phase 180 degrees with the time reference for the force. So in effect, the force is moving up and the beam is moving down. This reminds me a bit of the case with a paddle ball on a string on a board where you see children playing with such a game and and the board and the ball move in opposite directions, so you're out of phase when you get up above the first natural frequency. Um, this one's slightly higher. There's no meaning to that other than that you're a little bit closer to the natural frequency, but it's the sign change here that's important compared with the 8 hertz. Now let's look at the shape of the beam vibration as we raise frequency. We'll show the lower frequencies here and at the lower end you would be getting a quasi-static response that would 
probably come close to the static deflection of the beam under a static load. I probably won't sketch this very well, but let me try to do a little bit of a... And so our beam is oscillating, of course, between those upper and lower envelopes. At 4, 6, and 8 hertz, you are probably coming more and more similar to the first natural mode shape. But then as you reach 10 hertz, you get the surprising sudden 180 degree phase shift. But that makes sense, of course, as people who look at uh, these systems know. And here we see the frequency response curve for the magnitude of the motion at the tip. I haven't normalized that motion by a static deflection. Uh, you can see that that static deflection is about three and a half millimeters, half amplitude. And uh, in our particular curve, we follow the response to a point rather close to resonance and then follow on the other side as well. Because we're plotting absolute value, the 180 degrees phase shift that comes up through the natural frequency is not shown, of course, here as a sign change in the amplitude, but rather as a phase change on the phase plot for frequency response. The phase angle as a function of frequency is very interesting. There's a 180 degree phase shift. I've arbitrarily called this original phase uh, to be 360 degrees rather than zero, so that then the resultant drop brings us down to 180 degrees. Now, when there's zero damping, this happens very quickly, and I draw that as a vertical line. So far, we've been studying a beam with no damping. Now, it's important to add a little bit of damping to get a realistic problem because the undamped beam would go to infinite amplitude when you resonate it. We know every physical structure has some damping, so we'll start adding a little bit. In structural damping, we can add either an element-by-element element damping, shown here to the right, or we can add a system damping here at the left. If you want the system damping, you can enter that G parameter on a param entry. We will be using structural damping in, in our next uh, run, but let's talk about viscous damping as well. There are three ways that this can be entered into the NASTRAN data set. You can use uh, viscous elements called VISC, and these are rod-like, and they're illustrated over here. You can use a C-damp-1 card or a DMIG card to enter a damping matrix. You notice I'm using the old-fashioned word card here, and I'm more and more trying to replace that with the word entry, which is the modern version since we don't use cards. But it's uh, very hard to make an old dog learn new tricks, I guess. Okay. So let's do this rerun and uh, do it with damping now. And I'll take a structural damping coefficient globally of either five hundredths or one tenth. And that can easily be done just by adding a parameter card down in the uh, bulk data. Another thing I'm going to do is make XY frequency response plots. And it takes a bit, uh, a few tries to get those to work in NASTRAN, but uh, that's simple enough to do. And once you've got it, you've got it. Here are the data that I'll use for our improved run, including damping and frequency response plots. I show in red the cards that are added. And here is the G. Uh, comment on the subtitle card. Here's a request for the frequency response curves. To get those in the standard form, you have to do it in the uh, polar form where you use the word phase in displacement. If you don't do that, things don't work well. And uh, then we use the plotter here. 
And on these um, XY plots of displacement response, um, out here you have at node 3, the translation in the 3 direction, and we're using the magnitude there. And uh, the next plot you make at degree of freedom 3, we're doing phase. So it's magnitude and phase we're getting when we use this word phase up here in the displacement entry. To account for damping, we make only a modest change in the bulk data entry. At this level for a parameter card with G set in our first run to point 0.05. Our tabular results can be interrogated here to see what the effect of the damping has done. When we're just below the natural frequency, that is when we're at 8 hertz, we find this result where we're getting 348 degrees rather than the full 360. When we're above the frequency, we see rather than getting the 180, we're at 196. So this has softened that sudden jump into more of a gradual jump, and we'll see that in a uh, plot in a minute. I'm ready now to plot the combined results from runs with no damping, 0.05 damping and 0.10 damping. Interestingly though, these are all relatively small and you can see that although there are substantial differences, they uh, tend to lie pretty close to each other on a line that's uh, almost vertical. So um, it would be fun to redo this with a few more data points and really see where we come. In fact, it would be fun to see if, for instance, on G equals 0.1, whether you would peak out at 10 times this static uh, displacement. Because remember the magnitude um, enhancement for dynamics, call it the dynamic magnification factor, is 1 over g. Therefore, the maximum displacement ought to be 10 times the static displacement. Now let's look at the phase angle versus frequency. Here we have the three damping cases again, and you can see the last one, for instance, with G of 0.1, uh, has started to definitely soften. And the higher the damping then, the more that this curve would come more smoothly down. It would be fun to put some bigger numbers here, so I'll leave that up to the viewer to perhaps go up to G of 0.5 and see what that does in this problem. It certainly smooths out this phase jump. I pondered over these results some and, and re realized that there's a lot of interest in the industry about the shape in which a vibrating structure moves when it's forced near a natural frequency. And I wondered if there was some way to quantify how this structure approaches the mode shape you'd expect when you resonate it. Because when you're off resonance, what happens? Does it suddenly lurch into some other exotic uh, shape and do something completely off the wall? No, the answer is it rather smoothly changes its character as it passes through the resonant point and right at resonance achieves, with the structural damping anyway, uh, exactly the same shape as the eigenvector for the problem, which is the, uh, the uh, uh, undamped uh, mode shape. So in this figure, what I've done is to plot the ratio of U3 to U5. And this gives you some idea of the shape of the structure. Now, I admit that's only uh, one measure. You could have measured a bunch of others as well to really get the shape. But I put that ratio on the um, uh, ordinate here, the vertical axis, and then on the abscissa I've got the frequency. 
and where I've put a vertical green line is the natural frequency and that's also the resonant frequency with structural damping. And I looked at the eigenvector for the undamped problem and found that that ratio should be exactly this number here, 3395. And lo and behold, that's uh, what you get when you interpolate to that frequency from our rather smoothly changing curve. So I thought, gee, this is great. This shows how a system, um, when you excite it and pass through the uh, true natural frequency, you recover the mode shape uh, as a forced vibration. Remember, the true definition of a mode shape is unforced, is freely vibrating. And um, this is an undamped case. In principle, this would be an infinite amplitude at that point. So it might actually be hard to uh, carry out this test by taking very small frequency increments because as you approach that natural frequency, you would get an infinite result. So it's as if you could see a curve that came up and then there would be a slight break where you couldn't get the end to go on. But that, that point exactly reflects the uh, normal mode of the undamped structure. So that's kind of amazing and, and interesting. I repeated this same process in the neighborhood of the second natural frequency and resonant point. Those are identical. And when I did that, I found the same thing happens. And I plotted not only the undamped, but also the damp case, and that didn't change things. So isn't this interesting? We really do recover the shape of the eigenvector, which is the second normal mode, when you force the beam uh, at that frequency. And when you're in the neighborhood of that frequency, you get a shape that's in the neighborhood of that normal mode. So we really have shown then that as you oscillate a system, that as you pass through resonance, you really are picking up the free vibration character of that system. I think this further reinforces the idea of using the normal modes and frequencies of a structure as sort of a way to characterize the structure to other people. And it can now be well inferred that in the forced response problem, you indeed get the shape of the eigenvectors when the frequency is in that neighborhood. So I think that answers one question that I had always had. And I had never seen this shown explicitly like this.